There's a passage in Session 6, Chapter 4 of the Council of Trent that many people wrongly think teaches the idea of baptism of desire. This video will provide absolute logical proof that the passage did not teach baptism of desire. Here's the passage in Latin. Here's a proper English translation. First, note that this passage was notoriously mistranslated in the book called Denzinger. The Latin word sine, which means without, was mistranslated as except through. That mistranslation drastically changes the meaning of the passage. That notorious mistranslation is still widely used today on the internet by heretical groups such as the CMRI, which denies the church's teaching that all must have the Catholic faith to be saved. They deceive people in the process. The first thing to notice about this passage in Latin is that the word sine is a preposition which means without. This Latin preposition sine takes the ablative case. Now look at the words lavacro and voto in the same sentence. Lavacro means laver and voto means desire. Both lavacro and voto are in the ablative case because the preposition sine, meaning without, governs or applies to both words. This is crucial to understand. This means that if you want to understand the logic of this passage, you need to distribute the word without in your translation. Hence, a truly accurate translation that reflects the Latin grammar of the passage is, quote, This transition to justification after the gospel has been promulgated cannot take place without the laver of regeneration or without a desire for it, as it is written, unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, end quote. Notice that we've repeated the word without in the translation. That's because, as we mentioned, in the Latin, the word sine applies to both lavacro and voto. If you don't repeat or distribute the without when translating or discussing this sentence, although it still can be shown that it does not teach baptism of desire, there's more ambiguity involved. However, when you distribute the without as the Latin warrants, the logic of the passage is made more clear. The passage says that justification cannot take place without the laver of regeneration or without a desire for it as it is written John 3.5. Logically, that means that if either A, the laver of regeneration, or B, the desire for it, is missing, justification does not take place. Since justification does not take place if either one or the other is missing, both the laver of regeneration and the desire for it are necessary for justification. The logic of the passage demonstrates that it's not teaching that the desire for baptism is sufficient for justification in the absence of the laver of regeneration. Formulated in logical terms, since the preposition sine, meaning without, expresses negation and it applies to both lavacro and voto, the passage teaches, if not A or not B, justification does not happen. Note that the logic of the passage is not expressed as, if not A or B, which is different. Rather, the logic is, if not A or not B, that is, you must distribute the negation or the not, as we explained, because the sine, meaning without, applies to both words, laver and desire, in the passage. There was a famous logician and mathematician named De Morgan who is known for De Morgan's Laws. These laws express truths relating to logical conjunction, disjunction, and negation. Concerning the negation, if not A, or not B, which is what we see in this sentence of the Council of Trent, De Morgan's Law teaches that it's logically equivalent to the negation of A and B. That is, it's equivalent to, if not A and B. Here's an example. This car cannot be driven without gasoline or without the keys. Notice again that we've distributed the without. To properly understand the logic of Trent's passage, it's important to distribute the negation. This example means that if either gasoline or the keys is lacking, the car cannot be driven. Hence, both are required. Thus, if not A, gasoline, or not B, the keys, is logically equivalent to, if not A, gasoline, and B, the keys, as De Morgan's Law says. In Session 6, Chapter 4 of Trent, if not A, the laver, or not B, the desire for it, is logically equivalent to, justification does not happen, if not A, the laver, and B, the desire. Another example would be, this game of chess cannot be played without a chess board or without chess pieces. That means that if either a chess board or the set of chess pieces is lacking, the game cannot be played. Thus, both are required. Hence, if both A, the laver, and B, the desire for it, are not present, justification does not happen. Because justification does not happen if A, the laver, or B, the desire for it, is missing. That's the logic of the passage. That statement of Trent, that justification does not happen if either one is missing, is our position, and it's the position of those who believe that no one can be saved without water baptism. It is not the position of those who believe in baptism of desire, 
For they hold that justification is only necessarily prevented if both are missing, not if one or the other is missing. The passage does not teach that desire is sufficient for justification in the absence of baptism. To say that the passage teaches baptism of desire in the face of these facts is simply to deny the truth. The fact that this passage is not teaching the idea of baptism of desire or salvation without water baptism is why the very same sentence providentially ends by affirming John 3, 5, as it is written, unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That affirmation of John 3, 5, as it is written, is not consistent with the idea of baptism of desire. The position of baptism of desire means that John 3, 5 is not as it is written, but that it has exceptions. God made sure that the true meaning of Trent's passage in regard to the necessity of baptism was expressed by how the very same sentence ends, by affirming that no one is saved without being born again of water and the Holy Spirit in baptism. The true position that no one can be saved without water baptism is also what we find in all the other statements on the matter in Trent. Some might ask, if this passage says that desire for baptism is always required for justification, wouldn't that exclude infants? The answer is no, as we've explained before, because the passage is about the justification of the impious. That word in Latin only applies to those who have the use of the will, that is, those above the age of reason. In fact, that Latin word is even used to specifically distinguish wicked people above the age of reason from infants, as we showed in a previous video. I've encountered the word impious and its forms many times in Latin texts and marked many examples of its use. When it refers to people, it consistently refers to wicked people above the age of reason. Session 6, chapter 4 is a passage about adult justification. Session 6, chapter 4 teaches that desire for baptism is a condition, not a cause, of first justification in adults because adults must freely choose to be baptized in order to be justified. That served to contradict the heresy of many Protestants who denied free will and maintained that grace is irresistible. Those who claim that this passage is teaching baptism of desire not only fail to understand the logic of the passage, as we've shown, but they commit a fallacy of false cause. They confuse a condition with a cause. In fact, in the decree on original sin, Trent solemnly defined as a dogma the words of Jesus in John 3, 5. Thus, no one can be saved without the sacrament of baptism celebrated in water, just as Jesus Christ himself stated in John 3, 5. Those who claim in the face of these facts that Session 6, Chapter 4 of Trent teaches baptism of desire are misleading people and promoting that which is demonstrably false. The Council of Trent also declared this in Canon 5 on the sacrament of baptism, quote, If anyone shall say that baptism is optional, that is not necessary for salvation, let him be anathema. Canon 2 also states, if anyone shall say that real and natural water is not necessary for baptism, and on that account should distort those words of our Lord Jesus Christ, unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Spirit into some metaphor, let him be anathema." End quote. These canons contradict the idea that anyone can be saved without the sacrament of baptism. If baptism of desire were true, there would have been a canon or an explanation of it in Trent, but there wasn't because it's not true. In fact, here's a clip from a John 3, 5 mocker and a heretic totally misquoting Trent's teaching in the passage from Session 6, Chapter 4 on Justification. In Chapter 4 of this decree, the Council of Trent defines that justification from original sin can be obtained only by the sacrament of baptism. It says, however, that in the impossibility of receiving the water of the sacrament, Justification can be obtained by the desire of the sacrament of baptism. This heretic says that the passage we looked at, quote, says, however, that in the impossibility of receiving the water of the sacrament, justification can be obtained by the desire of the sacrament of baptism, end quote. But the passage does not say that at all, as we saw. The heretic has blatantly lied. He then proceeds to quote the passage which doesn't teach what he claimed it did. That's an example of how heretics deceive people. He makes other mistakes and false claims which are refuted in our material. A few comments about the word out in this passage. Some also ask, if Trent was teaching that both water and desire are necessary in the justification of adults, why didn't it say and instead of or? The answer is that it's more accurate to use the word or in this passage because in adults, justification does not occur if either water baptism or the desire for it is missing. The word and could arguably suggest that only when both water baptism and the desire for it are missing, justification is prevented. The word out, meaning or, more precisely expresses the truth on this point, and since the negation, that is the sine, is distributed, 
Trent's sentence is logically equivalent, as we've shown, to the statement that justification cannot take place without the lever of regeneration and the desire for it. Further, over the years, many have made the false claim that the Latin word out, which means or, cannot be used inclusively. That's utter nonsense. Out is used inclusively in countless Latin texts. See, for example, John 3, 8 in the Latin Vulgate and many other examples. Indeed, it's easy to prove that out is used inclusively in section 6, chapter 4 of Trent. Among other things, negation does not distribute over exclusive disjunction. And in this passage, the without indicating negation is distributed. Further, if out were used exclusively in this passage, as certain BOD supporters would have it, it would mean that someone could be justified by the desire for baptism, but could not be justified by water baptism. Since in exclusive disjunction, if one is true, the other is false. That's obviously not Trent's teaching, and it's not even the position of BOD supporters. Thus, out in this passage is used inclusively. That's a fact. The interpretation. Now, some might say, I cannot refute the logic of what you've presented, but what about the fact that various theologians after Trent, including some saints, thought that this passage taught baptism of desire? First, the true interpretation of this passage of Trent was providentially transmitted by St. Peter Canisius, a doctor of the church who attended the Council of Trent as a theologian. We have a video and an article on this matter. In 1555, after the relevant sessions of Trent relating to baptism and justification, St. Peter Canisius published his Greater or Larger Catechism. It was the first major catechism in church history and one of the most important documents of the Counter-Reformation. It received the approval of multiple popes, it was translated into 15 languages during his lifetime, and by 1686 it had gone through 400 editions. His catechism contradicts the idea of baptism of desire by twice teaching that no adult is saved, without water baptism, and by citing passages from early church fathers that specifically taught that unbaptized catechumens, no matter how much progress they make, cannot be forgiven or saved without water baptism. Well, the very idea of baptism of desire is that unbaptized catechumens can be forgiven without water baptism, and St. Peter Canisius contradicts that in his catechism by his direct references. In the very same section, St. Peter Canisius cites Session 6, Chapter 4 of Trent, the passage we've been discussing to teach that no adult is saved without the sacrament of baptism. And he doesn't teach baptism of desire anywhere in his large catechism, even though he had many chances to do so. St. Peter also cites Canon 5 on the sacrament of baptism, which declares that the sacrament of baptism is necessary without exception. Thus, he taught that no adult could be saved without the sacrament of baptism, including unbaptized catechumens who desire it, and he cited Session 6, Chapter 4 of Trent, among other things, to teach that. His understanding and interpretation of Session 6, Chapter 4 was much more important than the interpretation of other theologians, including the false understanding of this passage that was put forward by St. Alphonsus and St. Robert Bellarmine. For example, in discussing this issue, St. Alphonsus cited the wrong part of the Council of Trent. He cited a passage about the Sacrament of Penance, Session 14, Chapter 4, and he tried to apply it to first justification, but that's wrong. He also taught that one can be justified by baptism of desire, but not receive the removal of the temporal punishment due to sin. In other words, according to that theory, one can be justified and saved without even the grace of baptism or regeneration. That is demonstrably wrong and contrary to the teaching of Trent, which defined that no one can be justified the first time without being regenerated, and that that grace necessarily removes the temporal punishment due to sin. St. Alphonsus simply erred on the matter, yet that error, which maintained that one could be justified without the grace of baptism, was repeated by many theologians. That's why we ultimately must adhere to what the Chair of St. Peter has taught and the Church's professions of faith contain, rather than the opinions of theologians, even if they are saints and doctors of the Church. They were not given the protection that is given to successors of St. Peter in the papal office. See Luke chapter 22. St. Robert Bellarmine also erred in understanding this passage. Concerning Session 6, Chapter 4 of Trent, he taught, quote, Thus also the Council of Trent, Session 6, Chapter 4, says that baptism is necessary in reality or in desire, end quote. But that's totally wrong. The Council of Trent did not use the word necessary in Session 6, Chapter 4, as anyone can see. It also did not teach that justification can be attained by water or desire, or in reality or desire. Bellarmine misread and misquoted the Council. Rather, as we showed, Session 6, Chapter 4 taught that justification cannot take place without water baptism or without a desire for it as it is written John 3, 5. To say that something cannot take place without X or without Y is quite different from saying that something takes place 
by either X or Y. Trent's passage does not teach the concept of baptism of desire. Although the council did not use the word necessary in session 6, chapter 4 on justification, it did use the word necessary, as we saw, in the canons on the sacrament of baptism, the council affirmed the necessity of the sacrament of baptism without exception. Bellarmine and various others misread this passage because they assumed that a reference to desire in the context of justification and baptism must refer to baptism of desire, but it did not. They didn't look carefully enough at the language of the council, especially in light of all the church's dogmatic statements about baptism. In God's providence, he did not allow Trent to teach the false doctrine of baptism of desire, which would contradict the words of Jesus in John 3, 5, and so many defined truths of the faith about the unity of the church. Some also bring up the fact that various theologians who attended the Council of Trent believed in baptism of desire, and that this can be discovered from discussions that occurred at the Council. It's true that some people at Trent believed in baptism of desire, but that ultimately doesn't matter. In fact, St. Robert Bellarmine himself pointed out that not even all the acts of a council pertain to faith. Quote, in councils, the greater part of the acts does not pertain to faith, for neither disputations that are prefaced, nor reasons which are added, nor those things which are brought forth to explain and illustrate pertain to faith, but only the bare decrees themselves, and not all of these, but only those which are proposed as de fide, end quote. If not even all the published acts of a council constitute the church's teaching, how much more do discussions, preliminary drafts, etc. that were not part of the council's decree not constitute the church's teaching? What matters is what the council defines and decrees. That is protected by the Holy Spirit. We also showed how St. Peter Canisius, a doctor of the church who attended the Council of Trent as a theologian, transmitted the true understanding of this passage in his world-famous catechism. But following St. Thomas, many scholastic theologians believed in explicit baptism of desire, just like many of them denied the Immaculate Conception and taught delayed in Solman. They were wrong. Even though there were people at Trent who believed in baptism of desire, the Holy Spirit did not allow the error to be taught anywhere in the Council. Rather, the truth that no one is saved without water baptism was reaffirmed, and it continued to be affirmed in all official teachings of the Magisterium after Trent, and in professions of faith including in the encyclicals of Pius XI and Pius XII. An excellent illustration of the fact that solemn decrees of popes and councils stand on their own comes from the case of Pope Vigilius. We have a video on this matter. It's quite relevant to properly understanding the magisterium. In his first constitutum, Pope Vigilius expressed the view that the letter to Mari the Persian, which was attributed to Ebas of Edessa, was, despite some flaws, not heretical, but rather approved as orthodox by the Council of Chalcedon. Vigilius and many others thought that Chalcedon had approved the letter when it was read during the council, but the truth is that the council did not actually approve the letter. Vigilius was wrong, and the letter to Mari the Persian was actually heretical. It was contrary to the teaching of Chalcedon in the church, as Vigilius and the Second Council of Constantinople would later definitively declare. After expressing his view that Chalcedon had approved the letter to Mari the Persian, when it came to making his solemn decree on the matter, Vigilius decreed and ordained that the judgment of the fathers at Chalcedon in regard to the letter must be upheld. As we explained in our video on the matter, there's no error in the solemn decree because the judgment of Chalcedon could not be wrong, and in the solemn decree, Vigilius did not identify what Chalcedon's judgment was. However, as mentioned in other parts of the first constitutum, Vigilius expressed the view that Chalcedon held the letter to Mari to be orthodox. So a John 3.5 mocker and others who don't understand these matters would have to say that since in the very same document Pope Vigilius expressed the view that Chalcedon had approved the letter to Mari, that interpretation and understanding must represent the true understanding of his solemn decree on the matter. But they would be wrong. In fact, if you took that position, you would have to conclude that the Catholic Church defected when Vigilius published his first constitutum because the letter to Mari was heretical and not approved by Chalcedon. The only way to properly understand Vigilius's solemn decree that the judgment of Chalcedon about the letter is to be upheld is to recognize that the understanding Vigilius puts forward in other parts of the same document is wrong, and that his solemn decree is independent of the comments he makes in other parts of the same document. That demonstrates in striking fashion that solemn decrees must be understood strictly according to the language used and one cannot necessarily import meanings into them from outside statements, even from a statement in the same document that's not part of the solemn decree. Although one can, of course, learn from what theologians or draft documents or other discussions say about these matters, they ultimately don't determine the meaning of the church's solemn decree. 
If you cannot demonstrate that your position is consistent with what the church's decrees proclaim and contain, then your position is false. Supporters of baptism of desire also misuse a canon of trend about the sacraments in general. It also does not teach baptism of desire. See our article called The Council of Trent Did Not Teach Baptism of Desire for a Treatment of That Matter. The fact of the matter is that in Session 5, the Council of Trent dogmatically defined that the words of Jesus in John 3, 5 are a dogma, and it made no exceptions. That proves that the Catholic Church teaches that no one is saved without water baptism. The Council affirms that truth repeatedly, including in Session 6, Chapter 4 on Justification, which concludes its sentence by teaching that John 3, 5 is understood as it is written. We find more proof for the true position in Session 7 of Trent. It states, quote, For the completion of the salutary doctrine of justification, it has seemed fitting to treat of the most holy sacraments of the Church, through which all true justice either begins, or being begun is increased, or being lost is restored, end quote. The Council of Trent here teaches that all true justice, sanctifying grace, either begins, or is increased, or is restored at the sacraments. This means that all true justice must be at least one of the three, begun at the sacraments, increased at the sacraments, or restored at the sacraments. But the baptism of desire theory is that some people can have a true justice, that is sanctifying grace, that is none of the above three, since the person never receives a sacrament. Thus, the baptism of desire theory posits a true justice which is neither begun, nor increased, nor restored at the sacraments, but such an idea is contrary to the above teaching of Trent, and therefore the justice which they posit cannot be true justice. This shows again that baptism of desire is not a true teaching, but a false teaching that contradicts infallible Catholic truth.